I want to just say thanks up front to the uh, RSA conference for, for hosting us here. Uh, so I'm Holly Baruti. I'm the executive director for uh, U.S. Cyber Command. With me uh, is Chris Cleary, the principal cyber advisor for uh, the Navy. Dr. Wanda Jones Heath, the principal cyber advisor for the Air Force and Dr. Michael Solmeyer, the Principal Cyber Advisor for the Army. And don't worry, we will actually go into the panel questions and they will explain what that actually means. Um, so today, we're gonna be here to talk and pull back the, uh, the curtain in terms of what is the service's role in cyber and what is a Principal Cyber Advisor and what is the role that they, they have working with the services to, to prioritize cyber. Um, as a primer, I just want to give a few comments for what is Cyber Command and how do we actually work with the services and partner with them to be able to execute our mission. So Cyber Command is one of 11 combatant commands. Uh, we are the Pentagon's arm for directing and synchronizing cyberspace operations, and we're charged with three missions. One is we secure, operate, and defend the Department of Defense information networks, their weapon systems, um, and the data to make sure that our military has the foundational platform to perform its mission, right? And we are in daily contact with some of the most sophisticated uh, malicious cyber actors who are attempting to get into our networks uh, to, to make sure that we, are, can, we can protect the network against that. The second one is we de defend the nation in cyberspace from malicious cyber actors, from cyber attacks against our critical infrastructure, our defense industrial base, as well as the, the Department of Defense Information Networks. Um, we pursue malicious cyber actors in foreign space, um, and we enable our domestic partners, uh, both government uh, and industry, to make sure that we can protect the homeland, protect our, our networks. Um, our third mission that we're charged with is supporting, support to joint force commanders. We provide cyberspace um, options and capabilities to the joint force commanders, to combatant commands as part of their overarching campaigns that they build so that we can execute as part of a broader command uh, uh, campaign plan when authorized and directed to do so. Cyber Command is unique uh, as a combatant command, um, and the only other combatant command that is, is similar uh, in terms of authorities is uh, the Spe Special Operations Command. Not only does Cyber Command have authorities to be able to um, execute cyberspace um, operations across the defensive and offensive uh, spectrum of, of, of operations, um, but we also have authorities that are typically retained uh, by the services. Two that I want to highlight today that ties directly into the conversation we're going to be having uh, with the panel members um, is one, Cyber Command has been given the authority to set the training standards, training and certification standards for the cyber forces that are uh, provided to us by the services. Um, that ensures that there is uh, one standard across all of the services in terms of the skills that uh, personnel come to us with. The other one is um, enhanced budget control, which we'll execute for the first time this year in fiscal year 2024, and that uh, enables Cyber Command to control all of the resources across the cyber mission force to ensure that we can identify efficiencies uh, um, in terms of how the, the resource or resources are allocated and spent, um, and, and also ensure that they are prioritized to the nation's top cyber priorities. All of that requires really close uh, partnership with the services. When we perform operations, and you may have heard of this if you attended uh, General Hartman's uh, talk yesterday that he did with uh, um, Eric Goldstein with CISA, we talk a lot about our hunt forward operations, right? And we send our military teams to partner nations at the partner nation request to hunt for malicious cyber actors. Uh, and hunt for their malware and their tools, tactics, and procedures so that we can uh, defend against those, uh, those tactics within our networks. But those folks are not wearing CYRICOM uniforms. They're wearing Army uniforms, Air Force, Navy, Coast Guard, Space Force, right? And so um, it's really important that we are working extremely closely with the services in their role of being able to recruit, train and equip the forces that are presented to Cybercom to execute the mission. Uh, so with that as just a backdrop, I'm going to let's tur turn to the panel and I'll, I'll open up with the first set of questions. 
So the first question, to start us off, uh, can each of you explain the role of the principal cyber advisor? And let's start with you, uh, Wanda. Okay, uh, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity today uh, to be with my colleagues. And so I will start by saying that this position is congressionally mandated, so it makes it a little difficult sometimes um, to operate. Uh, section uh, 6057, there are seven areas that we focus on collectively. Um, from cyber readiness of our workforce, uh, acquisition of cyber capabilities, acquisition of cyber tools, the culture as it relates to cyber security, uh, the cyber security of our assets, which includes weapon systems, IT, and OT, um, also the cyber security and the supply chain risk management for industrial base. Um, included in that is that we certify the adequacy of our um, cyber space budget. Now how we execute our specific roles are different. Within the Department of Air Force, I represent the Air Force and Space Force. And within my role, uh, working for the Secretary, Honorable Kendall, he sees me as an honest, unfiltered um, voice when it comes to cyber, cybersecurity, IT, and cyberspace. And so he gives me a lot of free reign and authority to uh, bring the cyber stakeholders together in addition to work with our warfighters to make sure we understand what their requirements are as we move forward in cyber and cybersecurity. One of the things that I focus on in the first year uh, was to be an advocate and influence, uh, being able to connect the dots, uh, provide sound advice to the secretary on our investments and some things that we need to address as it specifically relates to Indo-PACOM and being able to um, win the war against China. So I'll stop there and let my colleagues talk about their execution role as well. Chris? So uh, I think Wanda hit all the, the, the main points, right? You know, if you go back to the law, the NDAA in 2020, you know, the three fundamental things that each of us do is advise our service secretaries, oversee the implementation of sort of policy and strategy document that comes out from higher levels from the, the Secretary of Defense or presidential strategy. Um, and then as Wanda called out, you know, weighing in on the adequacy of the, of the, the cyberspace activities budget. When you looked at the creation of the law back in 2020 from the success of what they had established in 2016 with the principal cyber advisor and the, the, the DASD for cyber policy at the OSD level, you know, they said, hey, this is kind of working. Let's, let's roll this out to the departments. I think one of the kind of the genesis of this was to try and get a single voice from each of the services. So for instance, I'm you know, Department of the Navy, so Navy and Marine Corps. Uh, you can imagine those discussions uh, when you bring those two services together uh, principally on how they're going to work together for combined operations now that we're moving away from sort of uh, conflict, traditionally land-based conflict, and the Navy and the Marine Corps are looking at, you know, the Indo-PACOM theater and how the Marine Corps becomes an amphibious force again, sort of back to its core roots, and how information operations are going to support that. But the other thing is, is as we try to uh, oversee the implementation of, of policy and strategy, which has been an interesting time for all of us, because if you remember... Uh, you know, when a new administration comes in, all those documents tend to change over. Everybody sort of writes a new policy, a new strategy, um, and those things have all just started to fall most recently. You know, we have the 2022 National Defense Strategy. There's, you know, Chris Inglis at the, it's a, at the Office of the President released his cyber strategy. Uh, OSD is getting released a cyber strategy. I'm sort of sitting on a Department of the Navy cyber strategy. So all of those things are getting to fall sort of like dominoes moving forward. And then how do we take those those documents, that guidance, and begin to, as Wanda called out, you know, ensure the adequacy of certain resources being applied to those mission sets are, are there to support what we do. Because, you know, in all honesty, you know, this is a relatively new mission. If we want to, if we want to snap the chalk line and call it 2010, you know, 2010 was the creation of U.S. Cybercom, and we all really started talking about this through the lens of not only um, what we do in cyber, but now there is a a subunified command, which became a fully uh, you know, combatant command, and how cyber gets integrated into operations uh, moving forward. And you can imagine, being 10 or 12 years into this, there is still a long way to go. Uh, and, and really, I think the PCAs were all in our collectively third years of the creation of this. So you know, think of startups in an organization like the Department of Defense uh, being mandated by Congress to say, hey, we are now going to have a principal cyber advisor in each of your departments. There's some growing pains associated with that. Uh, Michael, over to you. All right, well, it's great to be back at RSA and to be here with my wonderful colleagues. It's great to be out of the Pentagon as much as I love it and to get to wear Pentagon casual with you, which is, means not a black suit. Uh, look, let me just tell you from the Army standpoint, I got one guy to laugh in the front. From an Army standpoint, I think about the job as principal cyber advisor in three ways. 
I have to really advise the secretary on readiness, capabilities, and strategy alignment. So if you're taking notes, hang a star by readiness, capabilities, and strategy alignment. What do I mean by readiness? I gotta make sure that the Army is presenting teams that are trained and ready to Holly, and more than Holly, but to US Cyber Command and the organization which she represents, to General Nakasone, and the overall joint force. Capabilities, I've gotta make sure that the Army is equipping our forces with the right things, the right technology, so that Holly and others can employ that force with precision. And then I've got to make sure that the Army stays on side with the rest of the government and with the rest of the Department of Defense. Why? It's a really big Army. I did not know, I've been in the job a year, I didn't really realize how big the Army was. And if I was to cold call you gentlemen in the brown sweater and say, how big do you think the Army is? And you said, it's over a million. I'd say, you're right. Because when you add the active duty force, you add the reserves, you add the guard, and you add the civilians, you're over a million. So you gotta keep an army-wide narrative, both for the secretary, both for the Department of Defense, but also for the Congress and the press and industry. So that's how I see the job as being principal cyber advisor for the Department of the Army. Thank you. So Michael, let's stick with you. Can you talk about uh, what falls within the service cyber portfolio? Can you just kind of expand on that? Sure, let me give you a bit of a breakdown in terms of money and in terms of people. All right, so money. Right, the Office of Management and Budget, right, big US government-wide, sets a standard for how we're supposed to count, how we're supposed to come up with a no set of numbers for how much we spend on the cyber. Right? So that is called the Cyber Activities Budget. Hang a star by Cyber Activities Budget if you're taking notes at home. That's about $2 billion, a little less than $2 billion for the Army in the recent President's budget request for 24 for fiscal year 24. That's broken into three categories, cybersecurity, science and technology, and cyberspace operations. Won't go down into the, the details of each, but what I would say is that is not IT. That is not IT. There is a bigger budget for the services, for the Army in particular, for information technology, but if you're just talking about those three categories of the cyber, we think about it in terms of cybersecurity, science and technology, and operations. All right, then on the people side, right? Again, it's a big Army. So, home base for the Army is in Fort Gordon, the home of U.S. Army Cyber Command. If you count the entire kind of enterprise of the U.S. Army Cyber Command story and all of its subordinate components, you're over 15,000 human beings. That includes forces that are presented to Holly and at U.S. Cyber Command. It also includes a lot of people who operate and defend Army networks. But it doesn't include, right, a big chunk of our acquisition force that actually works on cyber issues. There's a schoolhouse that we'll get back to a little later about how we train and build professionals in this field. But I think the main thing I wanna leave you with is that, again, that's across guard, reserve, active component, and civilian that we're responsible for presenting those kinds of numbers both to take care of Army missions and to support U.S. Cyber Command, Holly and her colleagues. How's that? Thank you. So, Chris, can you talk about it from a Department of the Navy and Department of the Marine standpoint? So, almost ditto to everything Michael said from the composition. The numbers are, are strangely uh, similar, about $2 billion for our cyberspace activities budget. Um, you know, similarly, we have a larger IT spend. Uh, to, to kind of build on what Michael said, because I, I would basically paraphrase almost everything that he said, I'll just go a little bit further. Uh, so the Navy last year released a vision document, and for those of you who might be familiar with it, we coined you know, the idea of secure, survive, and strike. Because at the time when we were building this organization, you know, he had a pretty empowered CIO at the time, and one of the, one of the questions that always came is, well, how does the PCA differ from the CIO? And in the Department of the Navy, we understood, so I was working for Aaron Weiss as the CISO at the time, you know, he came out with his own strategy, was modernize and defend, and then we had secure, survive, strike. Well, the idea was where we partnered together on mostly the cybersecurity stuff. And when I talk about the secure bucket for the Navy, that's mostly what I'm talking about. Almost exclusively what happens at this conference for the most part. You know, uh, zero trust, identity management, RMF, RMF reform, 
Pfizer, all this stuff that goes into sort of the blocking and tackling of a secure program. And arguably, the lion's share of where we spend our money in the cyberspace activities, a good chunk of it goes to this. Uh, the set, but as you move to the right of that, where we began to differentiate as the PCA from the CIOs is sort of the war fighting aspects of what we do. So in the day, we are the Department of Defense. Uh, I, I, I get pretty aggressive when I do some of these talking points. You know, we have two core functions, is to basically deliver lethality or prevent lethality from being delivered upon us. And we do that in this space. You know, cyber is now a war fighting domain. Uh, it's, a, it's a new war fighting domain. We're still learning on what the processes are. But when we move to the right of what I like to call sur uh, survive, and you get in, so you talk about survive and strike. Well, now we're talking about things like defense critical infrastructure, weapon systems, things that were never really considered in the bucket of cybersecurity until the last couple years. You know, we've been beginning to talk about those two things specifically under some, um, there's something called the Strategic Cybersecurity Program where we talk about weapon systems and defense critical infrastructure um, and how we begin to resource capabilities uh, to go in there because not only do you have to secure those things, but they have to learn how to fight hurt. You know, those are the things that will be targeted by our adversaries to degrade our ability to do business. And when you look at the Navy, um, because we are an at-sea organization, both Navy and Marine Corps, we don't keep a lot of our garrisons. So when we talk about our organizations that are set up uh, ashore, those are kind of new for us. You know, they, when we stood up Fleet Cyber in 2010, it was kind of a new organization that was going to be predominantly a shore-based activity, uh, conducting operations in support of or supporting U.S. Cybercom through uh, the resources we provide to the Joint Force. Um, but then you kind of move into this idea of strike and this idea that, hey, this is a warfighting domain to, to, to again, par parrot on what uh, Michael said, you know, what capabilities do we need to, do we need to go and find and what, how are the ways we're gonna fight in this domain? How do we, how do we resource and equip not only our things that, that are provided to the mission force specifically, but then as we move into this new domains of warfare, things are gonna be afloat or aloft or, or, be, or coming from different platforms. Um, the reality of the situation is, you know, the Pandora's box of this space has been opened and it is a war fighting domain uh, and, and we're going to treat it as such. And I think as the PCAs continue to evolve in this space, I leave most of the sort of the security blocking and tackling to the CIO organization, which is already pretty well manned and equipped and resourced to do that. It's how do we begin to advocate for the other parts of the mission space that for in the Navy right now fall in maybe 15 or 20 different organizations that all have some piece of this. How do we begin to collectively pull that together to ensure that we're, you know, husbanding and marshalling resources appropriately to build those capabilities, to acquire those things, to train those individuals um, in support of this, this again, this new warfighting domain moving forward? Thank you. Juana, anything you want to add from your perspective? Um, just a few points. Um, we're comparably in size with, uh, you know, the Army and the Navy, uh, around 700,000 um, budget. Uh, same same alignment um, in, in uh, architect, um, but one of the things that um, we're also focused on with the warfighter, um, the boss uh, honorable uh, uh, Kendall talks about his operation imperatives. If you have not uh, read about it or heard anything about that, I suggest you do that. It's a bird's eye view into how we are organizing to be able to uh, do more within the cyber uh, portfolio. And one of the things that um, within the PCA that I stood up was the Task Force Sentinel Stand, and that was our way of really focusing in on Indo-PACOM region, looking at our critical assets, our mission, and then doing the investments to align to make sure that we are able to support the warfighter, especially during a contested um, fight. So, you know, we, we're doing the same thing. We have the same, you know, amount of budget, and, you know, we work very closely together, as you can tell. A lot of our comments are very much aligned, and then I support the Cybercom. A very good partner, and then for me, 16th Air Force um, out at San Antonio is a huge uh, partner in trying to make sure that we are able to secure and defend our networks and our assets. Great, thank you. So, uh, Michael, you had touched on earlier in terms of man, train, and equip, and we in the Department of Defense often have you know terminology that's not really well understood. But can you break down? What does it mean for the services to man, train, and equip the cyber force that is presented to, to Cyber Command? Absolutely. So the role of the services in law is to organize, train, and equip. Hang a star, organize, train, and equip. So what, is, what does that mean in practice? Well, for the Army, right, we look at this as building a profession. We're recruiting people, we're retaining people, we're ensuring their professional development, but years ago, Army leadership decided that cyber operations and cybersecurity were not going to be an additional duty 
for tank drivers or for artillerymen. It was going to be its own career. And so today, you can come into the Army as a soldier and spend your career, 20 years, doing this type of work without having to rotate out to other kinds of jobs. And that's a powerful prospect for folks who want to come in and really enjoy and are motivated and are fulfilled by the type of work that we're talking about today. Hands-on, technical, problem solving. So we build that profession. Hang a star by build that profession. That's the most critical part, I think, about the build and organize, train and equip and the organize. For the train, the Army also not just built a profession, but it built a schoolhouse, right? Schoolhouse, powerful, powerful construct for the Army. A lot of our main professions have a place where you go for all your training. The one-stop shop you gotta pass through. For ours, we have the Cyber Center of Excellence. It's not on everyone's uh, tourist map chart when you go visit Fort Gordon, Georgia, but it should be because it's a great place and it's really where we have that investment in professional development and excellence as our soldiers and civilians grow through our cyber force. And then equip, remember, organize, train, and equip are the three missions for the services. So for equip, we have a very large acquisition structure. A lot of you have seen in the news how the Army supports all the different efforts going on right now in Eastern, European, Eastern Europe through our acquisition functions. But that same pipeline, that same excellence as a service plays out, equipping our forces with the right equipment and technologies to be employed by U.S. Cybercom. Great. Wanda? Yeah, I'll just add a plug-in for our civilian workforce. Uh, we, we have the same uh, type of uh, structure for our uh, organized training and equip, but we're also focusing really heavily this year on our talent management, specifically for our civilians. Um, we need those civilians to be just as trained. We need them to have the right skills and the right equipment to be successful. That career field represents about 11,000 uh, folks across the globe. And so we are uh, making a concerted effort to retool those. You know, as we change our mission, get more, um, you know, technology in place, more automation, we need different types of skills. So our, this is the year that we're really focusing on retooling, um, retraining, and then doing some recruitment as well. Wanda, thank you, and, and, I, and I love the fact that you honed in and, and made the point that it's not just uniformed personnel, right? It's a lot of civilians across the workforce, so thanks for highlighting that. Chris, anything you would want to add? Yeah, I just, uh, I'm going to tip my hat to the Army, because I personally think the Army's doing it the best right now, uh, for everything that Michael just said. Uh, there's a lot of truth to the way the Army has embraced this doctrinally, culturally, set up the organization, they've developed, they've, they've poured a lot of resources into this. And actually, for Army, Navy jokes withstanding, um, I really have to do admire the way the Army is pulling this together. Um, the Navy was the first out of the gate when we created U.S. Cybercom and then Fleet Cyber to follow up with it. Uh, the Navy has got some work to do. We are just creating a cyber designator this year. Uh, the way that we've, we considered the community up to this point was living in something we called the cryptologic worker community, which is one of the oldest organizations in the Title 50 community, the way that we were doing, you know, SIGINT collections and working with NSA. And, and because that was the, where cyber was sort of born out of, the Navy was always there doing it through, through their NIACs and their signals uh, intelligence organizations. But now we've had to make a conscious decision to sort of subdivide that. And there are always things that we're gonna do specific to the intelligence community. And now it was time to create a specific cyber community to support more of the, again, I'll call it the, the Title 10 side of all of this, which we're in the process of doing now. Uh, but again, from that standpoint, we, we all look very similar. The Navy is the executive agent for the defensive cyber side of the, of the mission down in Pensacola, Florida, where our schoolhouses are. Uh, is where we sort of do a lot of the curriculum development for the we call the C&D side of the mission. I would think the Army is a little more on the offensive side of the mission. Um, the Air Force sort of sits, I would argue, kind of sits in the middle of all of that. Uh, but as we learn from each other, I think there are some things that we're going to, as opposed to try and reinvent the wheel, let's say in the Navy, is rip the cover page off some of the things that the other services are doing well. Uh, the one tip of the hat, I will make one more, because the Marine Corps shares a similar, I'll call it thread with the Army that the Army and the Marine Corps are, are individual-centric organizations. You are training the soldier, you are training the Marine. That is the capability, it is the sort of the flesh and blood where the Air Force and the Navy were more platform-centric. You know, when you talk about those services, you're talking about aircrafts, uh, submarines, aircraft carriers, B-21 Raiders, right? You're, you're talking about very, very expensive platforms uh, that 
consume a tremendous amount of resources within our organizations, and then we train you know, our components to do that. But just like what Michael said, you know, from the manned training and equip mission, you know, the Navy is not gonna have a, a war in Indo-PACOM. The Indo-PACOM is gonna have a fight out there, augmented or supported with the forces that we provide to that combatant commander to do that mission. No different with the US Cybercom with the, mission, with the resources that we're obligated to present back to the mission force. Thanks, Chris. All right, so let's uh, shift to a question I think is uh, a lot of the people in this audience will be very interested in. And uh, Michael, we'll start with you. What do the services need from industry? All right, big question, right? And uh, some, some thoughts, again, from the Army standpoint. So what's our you know, kind of take home point I, I led with you know, earlier? It's a big Army. Right. So when I have the pleasure of meeting with industry representatives, I am always up for hearing about a pilot project or how to start small, but I need you to think about extending that conversation to scale. So hang a star by scale. If you're gonna come talk to the Army, it doesn't have to start with scale, but at some point we're gonna have that part of the conversation. Why? It's a big Army, okay? So that's thing one. Thing two is zero trust, so hot right now, okay? So I, I know everybody you know, is gonna be talking about that. Very important to read the Department of Defense zero trust strategy, why? Because we're gonna look at how our higher headquarters frames that topic and we're gonna need to fall in behind it. But look at the pillar on data. Look at the pillar on data, right? That I think is one of the harder components of all the different aspects of zero trust. I, when I meet with folks to hear about industry pitches on zero, I'm always asking, I'm telling you up front, I'm always asking, tell me how you're thinking through the different aspects on data in the zero trust strategy. One thing I, you know, I'm always looking for opportunities for Army to do some training with industry. I think this is a relatively small program for us right now, but I'd like to see it grow over time it's a really great benefit for especially some of our junior and middle talent to be able to spend some time with you and understand the comparative advantage of when the partnership between government and industry where one plus one doesn't just equal two, but one plus one needs to equal more than two. That's what I'm interested in from the power of relationships between the Army and industry. And finally, when I'm looking at junior talent to either recruit or who I really wanna work with on the other side, I'm looking for critical thinking. I'm looking for the abilities by folks I'm working with to think and write and communicate and brief clearly, precisely, right? Not dumb down talk, but to speak without jargon. And so what my ask is work with your colleagues on how you talk about what you do. And we gotta do this a lot too in government. I mean, we love our jargon, we love our acronyms, mm -hmm. but working on precision of communication, and thought and clarity and critical thinking are, are really important tools I see to the industry government relationship. Great, thank you. Chris, anything you wanna add? So I, I, I love this question uh, because not too long, unlike maybe the other people on the stage, not too long ago, I was you. Uh, I've worked the vendor floor, I've sat in the booths, I have the late night steak dinners and drank, you know, I've, I've done this show a bunch on that side of the show. Uh, and we talk about what do we need industry for? We need industry for everything. There's, there's very, very few things that the Department of Defense makes. We don't make tanks or bullets or ships or airplanes or fuel or uh, shoelaces. We get everything from industry. And I think what's interesting about this space in particular, because we're sort of, we're, 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 we're going through the looking glass on some of this, because some of the capability that we did in the beginning to support these operations, we did make in-house. You know, if you go back to the history of NSA or some of these intelligence, you know, there was niche things that happened in dark corners of places where we built capability. But the question is, how does that scale? You know, we can't begin to scale in this space without industry. The relationship that has to be built is that you know, having been on that side, now on this side, and probably going back to that side again in the not too distant future, how do we build this relationship to understand that we need what it is that you do, because we can't do it ourselves. But I would ask you to think about this when you're, when you're talking with us. Yes, we're here, and zero trust is sort of the discussion um, of the day. Uh, the adversary gets a vote. You know, zero trust is not the last defensive architecture we're gonna be talking about. So what we're talking, because just a couple years ago we were talking about Comply to Connect, right? 
that was the, the and a couple years before that, it was defense in depth and you know, intrusion prevention. And you go all the way back to the beginning, it was just Symantec and malware protection. You know, this is a constantly evolving environment. And how does industry work with us to do that? But the thing I would ask you to think about is, as you do business with us, one of the, again, this is kind of a thought experiment. When I was at Tenable, I worked at Tenable for a couple years. We provide for the ACAS program. I remember talking to Amit when he came into the company. He said, hey, you know, Amit, we provide all the vulnerability information to the Department of Defense through one plug-in server that's for all practical purposes publicly available. You know that we're a legitimate military target now, right? Like a legitimate military target because of the business we do through the ACAS program, through the Department of Defense. A lot of you are gonna find yourselves in that crosshair as well, the more business you choose to do with us. Because if you're, particularly if you're providing us something that we need in a continual basis, just like I would need fuel or supplies at sea, there's a lot of things we're getting from industry on a regular basis. And how do you provide us that? And how do you ensure its availability or its deliverability, its survivability? And, the, and the, the last thing I'll say is, you know, when you look at building particular platforms, I think this is one of the things, I throw a bone to industry on this one because this is a fight we do in this side. You know, we look at information systems and technology, we're always trying to figure out how to, how to uh, do it cheaper, better, faster. Um, the Arleigh Burke Destroyer is not a COTS piece of equipment. I just did not go buy that off the street somewhere. It's a specifically designed platform to be able to sustain adversary activity and, and take damage. It's designed to be shot at. When I start building networks or defense critical infrastructure that in themselves are designed to be shot at, designed to be attacked, and I mean that word very specifically, designed to be broken or attempted to be broken, we have to start thinking about the resourcing behind that. Those things are gonna cost money. The Arleigh Burke, again, the Arleigh Burke Destroyer, the Joint Strike Fighter, is not an inexpensive piece of equipment because of the way we had to build it to be survivable in a modern combat environment. This environment, what we do in the defense industrial base with networks, defense critical infrastructure, weapon systems, offensive capability, all has to be built with sort of a different mindset. And I would ask industry, as we treat tradition, as we transition from things like zero trust, which live in sort of the, the, the traditional enterprise IT security space, into things that I'm going to need to enable war fighting. It's a different mindset. Oh, Wanda. Wanda. All right, a uh, couple, couple thoughts here. Um, definitely go and read uh, some of the documents that we mentioned today to learn about the DOD ecosystem. Uh, the things that we care about are outlined in all those documents from the White House down to the specific service. Um, I would also uh, ask uh, both, um, Michael mentioned data, you mentioned um, you know, protecting the network you know, from the adversary. This is a partnership. Um, we can't do it by ourselves. We depend on industry to uh, help us come up with uh, solutions that work for our ecosystem. Um, we don't wanna keep adding and adding. We wanna be able to lessen the integration piece of that by having solutions that can work across different platforms, whether it's our IT, our OT. Uh, we want best practices. We want you to come in with some great solutions. Challenge our thought process. Sometimes we get kind of stagnant because we don't have the expertise in most cases. So we will depend on our industry partners to bring that through. And then lastly, if you are developing uh, software, make sure you think about um, the entire process. Make sure you develop it well, that you vet it, and then you secure it. So when it's delivered, we don't have to ask those types of questions. Great. And Wanda, let's, let's stay with you. So each of you have decades of experience in the cyber business. What are some of the biggest myths that you've heard? And can you, uh, can you help us set us straight on some of those myths? Um, one of the ones, so I was the former CISO, um, like uh, my colleague here, um, uh, Chris, uh, for the department. Um, coming from that seat to this one, uh, and Michael mentioned it, uh, it it's a lot. Um, and one of the things that um, I often heard was cybersecurity is not a value added uh, proposition when it comes to the warfighter. Uh, you know, in, in having a lot of conversations with our non uh, cyber stakeholders, I spend a lot of time with our operators, under, you know, understanding their mission, what they think they need, their requirements, um, what they think about the community at large. And yes, we may have a branding problem because we talk uh, to each other very well. Um, so being able to talk to non-cyber people, um, you know, makes a difference. So cyber is a value um, added uh, profession. Um, we don't want to partner with industry. That is definitely not true. Um, as I mentioned before, we need um, a lot of what you have to offer from your workforce uh, expertise and skills to the things that you bring to the table for our capabilities. 
Great, thank you. And uh, Chris, we'll go to you next. So uh, the myth thing, uh, you know, it's hard to talk about that here because we're all true believers. You know, for this conference, the people in this room, we wouldn't be here if we weren't believers in this space that cybersecurity is required and it's a warfighting domain and blah, 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 all that other stuff. But, and, and Wanda stole a little bit of my thunder. Um, the myth is not with us. The myth is with the people who are not in this room, the people who don't come to these conferences, the people that don't consider themselves part of the information technology community, and get them to understand that almost everything that they do within the Department of Defense is underpinned by this environment in one way, shape, or form. You know, I can't push fuel around the theater if I don't have defense critical infrastructure to do that. Uh, the logistics systems that require unclassified networks to talk with our distributors, let alone our classified networks and stuff. So the, 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 the story that we try to get out is, is not as much to this group, but you know, how do the PCAs sort of evangelize within the rest of the Navy that has been doing you know, combined arms kinetic warfighting for, in some instances, hundreds of years, um, that try to, are trying to envision how this domain of warfare can be leveraged to enable what they do, or at least to appreciate how it supports what they do. And then it's as, as this gets up to continue to build credibility through this space, that the things the adversary is getting very, very good at will impede your ability to do your missions forward about things that you've never thought. And we've seen it touched a little bit, right? Colonial pipeline and solar winds. I mean, the big stories have been out there and people are aware of it. You know, if you go in the Pentagon, all the leaders can throw out solar, you know, they can all say that. Oh yeah, solar winds, log 4J, colonial pipeline. Yeah, Chris, got it. Okay, do you really get it? Because I'm fighting for resources every day to, do, to, to, to enable the things that you really, really need. And it's how does this community go to the aviation you know, uh, conference, the surface warfare conference, the land warfare conference, and be able to get a part of that, or how do I get them to come to us? Which is part of, I think that's the myth that we're trying to break, that this is a real thing, uh, it's the future, and how we resource, man, and train the space moving forward to enable all of that. Michael, what's the star? I think that's what you're saying. Like, <laughs> the that's the star, Thanks what's the star? star? Michael. Can you tell I spent too, too much time in academia, yeah. uh, encouraging good note taking? So I, I think a couple, you know, a couple myths that, that hit me. I mean, the, the first is it, is, it is obvious that, that our field here is one that places a premium on understanding technology. But I think increasingly the more time I spend with the service, right, with the Army, I'm seeing that without the, the human, without the people, right, the, the technology doesn't get used as good as it, it could be or should be. That is, hang a star by, really focusing on the people, right? That's, that's a big takeaway that I've learned over the last year especially. I mean, I knew it beforehand, working at Cyber Command, working in other places, but I feel like I'm really living it right now, right? And so when I'm learning about new technologies, I'm also now starting to think, well, how are my 17 series, right? What we call our, our cyber people in the service, how are they gonna use that technology? What's the human aspect to actually employing the right technology in the right ways? So not just technology, but also the huge aspect of people being involved in the technology. Second thing is I think a lot of leaders on the cybersecurity side, on the defense side, is there's still a bit of intimidation on cost. There's still a lot of intimidation in saying, well, to be cyber secure, it's going to cost so much more. And I, I think two things on that. Yes, there's, there's probably some sort of bill to be paid at some point. But configuration changes can actually do a lot to make an existing asset more secure. But also, you're going to pay anyway. You're going to pay anyway when you get hit. Or when the information or your intellectual property or your proprietary data is stolen and you've got to redo it, you're going to pay. So the, the financial, I, I think, discussion and the discussion about how we think about cost needs to be relaxed a little in terms of the constraints on definition of how much does cybersecurity cost. It's over the life cycle of a capability, not just I want to buy a particular cyber widget. Right? That, I would believe, is too narrow of a way to look at how much does cybersecurity cost? And the third thing I would say in terms of a myth is that, you know, in, in government, it's like, oh, the, the senior folks, you know, they're, we're still learning through, we're still getting initial exposure to cyber issues. I'd say the senior leaders that I work with today have been in repeat tours in high positions of responsibility 
where they know a lot about the details of our field. And that is really impressive because they know a lot about other fields too. But when they started their career, it's not like they came up as a cyber technician or cryptologic warfare officer in the Navy or anything like that. But when you look at the leading generals in the Army and their backgrounds, it's fascinating to see the repeat tours that they've had where they've gotten senior level exposure to these issues. So we're on a really good trajectory in terms of our senior leader management in the services today. Can I piggyback on that just for a minute? Just because, Michael, you made me think of something. Um, to boil down something that Michael said is, you know, I, I use the analogy, you know, there's, there's aeronautical engineers and there's fighter pilots. They're intrinsically linked, but they're very, very different, right? It's not to say an aeronautical engineer doesn't know how to get an airplane and fly it, but does he, does he really know what a one and two circle fight is, right? Does he really understand air combat maneuvering? I think that's kind of where we're getting into this space, particularly with the technology that's presented to us. If this was a land warfare or a naval warfare thing and I presented another ship to the Navy, the, whoever developed the ship is not gonna take the, sh the, the, you know, the crew out to it and ex explain them how to do a sea and anchor detail. And there's certain things that we've been doing for hundreds of years that we just have another new platform to go do it. This space is very, very different from that. You know, the tactics, techniques, and procedures, how some of this capability would use, it's not just throwing it over to the fence to a, to a fully informed and trained workforce that knows how to maybe completely embrace that technology leverage it, use it the right the way it was designed to be used like we do in all the other domains of warfare. So that's another thing I would ask that when you go out to industry, it's not only how the tool works, but how would you use it? You know, how would you employ it? What are the things that we need to be uh, particularly spun up on when you bring us something that new? So just piling on to Michael. Thanks, Chris. Okay, uh, can we talk about the national cyber strategy? So President Biden just recently signed the national cyber strategy um, there's a lot in there, and just wanted to get your thoughts in terms of what stands out to you. And we'll start with you, Michael. Yeah, there, there was a particular line, uh, and, it, and I know it'll uh, surprise many of you that you know I don't, like memorize lines of the national cyber strategy, but that is what I do for fun. But there was a particular line in that document which really struck me. And it, it might be easy to miss, but I think it's a powerful one, so I will read it. I'll do a, a bit of a dramatic reading uh, for you, but it's really, you know, it's about shifting and, you know, the need to rebalance the responsibility to defend cyberspace and shifting the burden for cybersecurity away from small businesses, individuals, and local governments, and onto organizations that are most capable and best positioned to reduce risks for all of us. That's a powerful statement. That's a powerful statement for a national level document about rebalancing the burden for how we think about cybersecurity. And I think it's terrific. So, you know, as a service and as an army, our job is to think about, well, what does that mean for us, for the small businesses we work with, for the communities in which the army is so tightly integrated across the country and around the world where the army has installations. So that's the, the line that we're really trying to go to school on in our service right now and figuring out how we can walk that walk. Thank you. Wanda, anything you want to add? Uh, a couple of areas here. Um, modernization, we, you know, the strategy talks about, you know, how do we modernize smartly, um, addressing the things that we can. We don't have enough money to really fix everything we need, but we need to do it smartly. Uh, focusing on quantum resistance, um, encryption, and how do we communicate uh, just within our service, but also to our uh, industry partners if needed, as well as our, our other services, and definitely uh, our, our coalition uh, partners. And then another area that, um, that I'm focusing on is the R&D in cybersecurity. Uh, we need smart solutions. Um, working a lot with our senior military colleges on some research and development opportunities, as well as you know with some industry. And then lastly, um, continuing our public-private uh, collaboration. This is a team sport. Um, it takes everyone to be um, in the game. Um, and so if you are on the sidelines and, and trying to figure out how do you work with us, um, certainly, uh, as I mentioned before, understand our ecosystem, uh, understand what we value as we talk about the different um, uh, documents that's been recently released. Great, thank you. And that's one of two of my favorite mantras, right? Cyber is a team sport and uh, cybersecurity is national security. So thanks for highlighting that. Chris, anything you want to yeah, add? I'll just, uh, 
again, I'll, I'll follow Michael on this. Uh, I love the line that he read. Uh, when I hear that, though, I put on sort of my other hat. I put on the, the hat that I used to wear, uh, and I listen through it to some sort of your ears. And what does that mean to you in the, in the room? Yes, we do have to figure out how to balance the responsibilities of, of capabilities that are going to be made, used, supported, everything that, that industry needs to provide us. And yeah, industry does need to do better. And there are SAR companies that are resourced that have resourcing to provide better things. If you look at cyber in particular, you know, there were things we did 20 years ago. This wasn't even a design consideration. Now it is. So, so when, I, when I read that, I'm sort of convinced that industry is just good business, that to make products and tools and services that are just have cyber more incorporated into it, it's just, it's just going to be the cost of doing business. Right now, we're, we're, we're sort of pushing some of the narrative back to you and said, hey, this is the cost of doing business now. So as opposed to adding it on as some sort of feature, it should really come baked into the product. Uh, and, and that is, I think, one of these, again, shared responsibilities that go between us, because I'll, I'll end it with the way I started it. Um, the adversary gets a vote. You know, well-resourced, dedicated, sophisticated adversaries are just not going to go, up oh, zero trust. Damn it. I guess, it's, I guess we're just going to give up on this. You know, they will continue to figure out ways around all of this. So it's this collective combined responsibility to do the best that you can do with whatever you're providing to the Department of Defense. We are going to learn to use it appropriately and then have the conversation and dialogue that goes back and forth to continue to improve the process or the product or the service. And I think that was the core of what the, the, the national strategy was trying to get at. Great, thank you. Okay, we're in our last few minutes, so I just want to uh, ask each panel member, if you had some final thoughts that you wanted to leave the audience with, what would that be? And Wanda, we'll, we'll start with you. Um, I already said both of them, uh, you know, it's a team sport, and it's about the nation, the security, uh, being able to continue the, the way we are, the way we like to live, um, and then thinking about, you know, how can we collectively uh, make a difference? Great, thank you. Chris? Uh, you know, broken record on this, it's, it's war fighting. You know, it's, it's part of what we do. It's the new domain that we're, we're learning and, in, and embracing. Uh, and I just invite industry to come along for the ride because that's, it's required. We can't do it without you. Great. And Michael, we'll give you the last word. I'll, I'll just come back to the, the point I made about the power of the partnership with industry and that I'd, I'd really like to see for, for us, and I don't mean to speak for my other service colleagues, but that ability to train with you, to work with you, so that we can actually uh, critically think and work on tough common problems together. I think that's uh, uncharted or undercharted territory that we can all work on together. So if anyone out there is interested in it, I'd love to be able to talk with you about it throughout the week. Great, thank you. So just to close us out, I um, want to say thank you to each of the panel members for participating today. Thank you to all of you in the audience for, for uh, attending and, and listening, and we hope you uh, took a little bit more out of what does Cyber Command do, how do we partner with the services, and how do the services prioritize cyber and, and uh, manage across their portfolios. And I uh, also want to say one last thanks to the RSA Conference for, uh, for hosting us here for this talk. Thank you very much.